75 years ago, as war raged in Europe and Japan, delegates from all over the world gathered in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, to build a new global financial system. Through their creativity and collaboration, billions were lifted out of poverty all over the world, and the American middle class was created. But nearly a century later, it's time to recognize that the global economy has changed. We need a new system, one that builds on what worked, free markets and free people, and changes what doesn't. We need a new path for the future of capitalism. So countries can heal fractures within their own economies. From excessive inequality to job loss from technology, we need to win the race for the future of money. The rise of digital currencies, the long-term health of the euro and the dollar. We need to harness all the tools of economic statecraft. From using sanctions and trade policy wisely to reining in financial crime. Most of all, we need to remember what they knew in 1945. Economics, finance, and foreign policy are all part of the same story. This is a time to restore and rebuild America's collaborative economic leadership. This is a time for geoeconomics. Well, good morning. I'm Josh Lipsky, the director of the Geoeconomics Center here at the Atlantic Council. And it's really a pleasure and an honor to welcome everyone for today's conversation on how the pandemic is disrupting global trade, the effects on the global economic recovery, and the lessons we can all learn moving forward. Now, of course, this is a topic that's been front and center of the news over the past week, as we've seen the evolving situation in the Suez. And that's rightfully so. Over 13% of world trade flows through the Suez. But it's something we've been focused on at the Atlantic Council long before the current crisis, and really something we've been talking about the entire past year during the course of the pandemic. We know that global shipping is under strain, supply strains have been stretched thin, sometimes even broken, ports have been overwhelmed, and more broadly, the nature of global commerce is changing with the rise of trade and trade in services versus trade in goods. So this is something that predates what happened in Suez and will outlast what happened in Suez. And that's really what we want to talk about today. So to understand the implications of this, we've assembled really an expert panel. We've brought folks together with public sector experience, private sector experience, uh, leaders in the industry, folks who've been working very hard, especially the past week with this evolving crisis. So we're grateful for their time. And what we wanna talk about today is not just what's gonna happen in 2021 with global trade, but what's gonna happen in the coming years? What's gonna be the evolving nature of global trade? What is the US and European role in that process? So that's the conversation we're excited to have. I wanna thank everyone at the Geoeconomic Center who helped put this together, Associate Director Ole Moore, I want to thank our supporters at the Council, board members Costas Krantazopoulos, Chairman of the Atlantic Council, John Rogers. And one logistical note, please use the Q&A function in the Zoom chat uh, to put your questions. We're going to try to get to as many as possible today. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, who will take us through our panel, uh, Costas Paris, a 20-year veteran in the Wall Street Journal who covers trade and supply chains and logistics. So he's been also very busy this week, and we're grateful for his time. Costas, over to you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to uh, uh, be part uh, of, of this event uh, and have so many uh, distinguished guests. Uh, we are uh, just a few, but we are still into uh, uh, the Suez uh, 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 Canal uh, choke uh, with, this, with a ship uh, being stuck there. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is going to be quite interesting discussion. So let me uh, uh, introduce uh, our panel. Uh, if, uh, let me start with Chris Rogers. Uh, Chris is uh, a uh, trade supply uh, chase contributor for SFP Global uh, Market Intelligence. And his research uh, 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 covers international trade policy, logistics state trends, and an analysis of industrial supply chain. Uh, previously, uh, Chris uh, worked uh, as an international trade analyst at Bloomberg uh, Intelligence, uh, or, uh, after spending about 20 years covering the global supply industry as uh, a sell-side sell analyst for institutions, including JP Morgan. Uh, hi, Chris. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, our second, uh, uh, let me uh, let me move on, move on to Penelope uh, Das. She is the president of International Public Affairs and Sustainability for UPS, United Parcel Service, uh, uh, and and uh, and uh, the movement of cargo uh, uh, from from uh, uh, ships to plane has been increasing over uh, uh, the last months. Uh, and Penny, I'm sure. Uh, with will will give us uh, some good insights. Uh, moving on, Barbara Matthews. She is the chief executive of BSM Tra uh, Strategy and a senior fail uh, fellow at the Geoeconomic Center uh, of the Atlantic Council. And Barbara uh, is a managing director and founder of BSM International Regulatory Analytics that focuses on using data uh, and analysis to craft public policy through a patented process, including uh, uh, NLP and ML technology. There has been uh, a number of uh, events, uh, and we all know about the problems with crew changes. Uh, Barbara, I think, uh, uh, will uh, provide us with some very, very useful. Let me start uh, with my first question. Uh, uh, which, of course, uh, uh, has to do with the blockade, the Suez Canal. It's a week before the Ever Green ship uh, was unlodged. Uh, and uh, everyone in the industry, supply chain, shipping, uh, argue uh, that this is going to exacerbate the situation uh, the situation of congestion, congestion uh, issues at ports uh, around the world and further delay cargo deliveries. Uh, as a follow-up, there has been also a lot of thoughts and some criticism about how safe are ultra-large container ships, especially those which are 18,000 containers and more, to transit narrow waterways uh, like uh, the Swiss. So uh, uh, maybe Chris, can we, uh, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Well, um, firstly, thanks for that, Costas, and thanks to the Atlantic Council for having us along. Um, so I think when it comes to the Suez blockage specifically, um, you know, clearly they couldn't have come at a worse time for the global logistics industry. Um, we've shown repeatedly in our research that you know, since August of last year, there's been a significant surge in global trade, um, largely driven by consumer goods. So it's the stay at home. I have a lovely shiny new monitor in front of me that will have been shipped from China to the United Kingdom. And there's been a continuing growth in that. And, and that led to uh, congestion in most of the major seaports, both, both in Western Europe um, and in the United States, the big consumption centers um, at the same time, um, you know, the, the ports have been trying to work through that. We end up with this blockage um, in, in the Suez Canal. Um, when we think about the markets that that will have an effect on, um, you can split them into um, three broad areas. Firstly, um, Asia to Europe um, and pretty much everything that goes from Asia to Europe uh, that's containerized um, is uh, carried through the Suez Canal. So, you know, there's a significant impact coming. Clearly, some of the Western European ports will have a few days to work through the existing backlog that they've got, um, but then they're going to very rapidly have um, a whole load of boats arrive that don't just need to be emptied, but that also need to be refilled, of course. And it's notable that um, some of the container lines, including Hapag Lloyd, are putting limitations on when containers can be delivered into European ports for export back to Asia. And that's the second big market. That's the uh, products produced in Europe, particularly intermediate capital goods produced in places like Germany that are going to be shipped back to Asia. So you've already got you know, not just a one week delay of products arriving from Asia to Europe, but then that return journey that could be you know, delayed a lot more than that. The network effects or the ripple effects that have been referred to um, by a lot of commentators you know, will we'll take a long time to work through. The third market is the US East Coast, um, and that flows principally from Southern Asia. So that's flows from India, uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and the Middle East. 
and those uh, routes uh, will be slowed down. That includes oil shipments um, as well as consumer goods uh, across a lot of different industries, but primarily uh, consumer goods um, on that routing as well. So, you know, to a certain extent, when it comes to the Suez Canal issue specifically, you know, there's there's something for everybody to to worry about that. Um, when we think about the um, safety or otherwise of of the vessels to to touch on that broadly, I would say that you know it, it's worth bearing in mind that the Suez Canal blockage is just one of many challenges that the large container ships have faced recently. Um, another major one has been the loss of containers at sea. We've seen five major instances of containers being lost at sea um, at the beginning of this year. Um, is that because you know of the way boats are loaded? We don't know, but it's only happening to the biggest boats in the biggest storms. And you know, without getting into the hydrodynamics of it and so on, you know, there are concerns about the speed the boats are being run at and the uh, degree to which they're being filled, whilst this demand is here to get as much shipping done as possible. It's also worth casting your mind back to uh, the beginning of uh, 2019, and throughout 2019, there were a number of onboard vessel fires um, that occurred, um, not just in container ships, but uh, there were issues there as well. And of course, as you discussed, um, the whole issue of actually unloading these things um, at the ports as well. We uh, wrote some analysis just in the past day or so um, that showed that the port of Long Beach, 60% um, of volumes offloaded um, in the fourth quarter of 2020 were uh, very large or ultra large container ships, so 10,000 TEUs or above. Um, in the prior part of 2020, um, that had only been 46%, and it had been even lower than that in 2019. So um, when you look at where the big boats are arriving, they're where, arriving at the biggest ports and causing the biggest congestion. So LA, Long Beach, and New York uh, in the United States. And it's not like there haven't been similar problems at the Asian loading ports as well. So. You know, I think the, the container companies are doing the best they can to um, get the goods where they need to go. They're doing the best they can to operate safely. Um, but, you know, in the same way that now is a good time for companies to think about how their supply chains are running after the pandemic, it's a good time for the container lines and other shipping companies to think about how they're organising and running their networks in light of all the challenges that have been faced recently. So, Chris, uh before we go on, uh, let me just introduce uh, uh, another uh, uh, panelist. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, 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 Megan Green, uh, who is a senior fellow. Hi, Megan, the senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. Megan currently uh, serves as a senior fe uh, fellow at the uh, Mossabar Rafati Center for Business and Government at Harvard uh, Kennedy School. She's also the first Dub Dunn uh, Julius senior fellow in international economics at uh, Chatham House. Uh, I would welcome her. And so uh, to follow up, uh, to follow up uh, uh, Chris's, uh, uh, Chris's uh, thoughts, uh, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to uh, 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 ask the other panelists uh, if we can, if we can, uh, if we can start uh, uh, with you, uh, Penny, uh, to uh, talk to us a little bit uh, again about the, uh, the supply chain issues. Uh, and uh, uh, how much uh, do you see, uh, how much cargo do you see uh, moving by air uh, now compared uh, with the past? And how much, uh, and what does this, this mean for uh, the supply chain, what does this mean for freight forwarders uh, and and the end consumers that would will will have to pay the higher transportation air costs? Yeah, well, <clears throat> thank you very much. And um, I think Chris covered a lot of um, great points that are just as equally important in the air cargo or the aviation industry today as in the the as in the shipping industry. There's a lot going on that's really changing the dynamics of the industry, <clears throat> excuse me, very quickly. And so, number one, and I think Chris referenced this, was 
these massive shifts in consumer spending that um, have taken place as well as business. Um, I would throw in the business side of that as well. We've just seen massive shifts in the past year, year and a half in terms of some of the sourcing and shifts. Um, and at the same time, you're dealing with a relatively static industry in that capacity is normally um, uh, limited. You're, you're dealing with the, the universe, the capacity you have to try to move things around the world. Um, at, at that particular moment, and adding capacity or, or is, is almost impossible in, in, in quick conditions. At the same time, what we've seen in the aviation industry is we've lost about half of our, our air cargo capacity with the passenger airlines. Um, most of that, a big chunk of what, what moved around the world moved in the bellies of, of passenger aircraft. And with that coming offline, you had these extreme demand shocks uh, coupled with some extreme supply shocks uh, during the past year. And I think you've seen some similar things with spot rates. You've seen some similar things with bookings with regards to both air cargo as well as with shipping. And I think all this points to a couple of larger trends that we need to keep in mind, one of which is speed. And so um, how do you deal with industries that, would, that, that, that do long-term planning and need long-term planning for stability? in terms of movement, yet things are moving uh, today and consumer demand and industries are pushing at a pace that's extremely quick. That also has climate implications because when you move things quickly or when you move things at a moment's notice, you have to take into account the, the impacts of that versus using other modals, um, maybe less, less, uh, less carbon intensive modes. The second thing is digitalization, and there's quite a bit going on in that space, but when you have some of these investments that are taking place over very long periods of time, it takes a while for the digitalization to, to catch up. So the, the last point I would make um, with regards to where things are going with supply chains is the very human impact of what's still going on out there, which is that we still have COVID and staffing is still down, and it's still incredibly hard to move um, maritime crew, air crew, and others around the world because of COVID. And that's creating an additional shock on the labor side that we're all having to deal with and grapple with. And that then plays into supply chains and how supply chains can need to be planned and react with regards to how the industry is currently, some of the things that we're currently grappling with in the industry. Thank you. Thanks. Megan. Uh, can, I, uh, can I come to you and ask one question that uh, uh, I, I also see from our uh, attendees? How, is the, how do governments, uh, how do finance ministers, how do trade executives, uh, and of course, uh, 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 transportation sector, the transportation sector, uh, uh, treat all this? Uh, is there, with all the supply chain, there has been increased talk, a lot of talk, of diversifying production uh, away from China? Uh, it started with a pandemic. We need more masks. We couldn't find masks. We couldn't find sanitizer. Uh, so we have to, to, to produce these things locally uh, and not only these things. When China opened up, all these things were forgotten or are getting forgotten quite fast. Globalization has been probably here to stay. China is still the most efficient production center uh, in the world, uh, and uh, the most uh, and makes sense uh, as far as cost is, is the most cost effective. Is anything going to change in those supply chains uh, or not? Yeah, so I guess I would say this this debate started long before COVID, long before the Suez Canal got blocked. And we, we had this debate after 9-11. We had it after the global financial crisis. There was a threat with, um, you know, volcanoes in Iceland, uh, Fukushima melting down, Brexit, Trump. So this is a debate we keep having because there are there is a balance between um, efficiency on the one hand and resilience on the other. And so we've now seen that there are real vulnerabilities that come out when you have these kind of choke points um, that emerge. And there's no way to get rid of the choke points entirely um, without uh, increasing your costs significantly. So we've seen that globalization started receding long before COVID 
hit us, um, but globalization probably is here to stay. And I think the, the stress really isn't on localization of supply chains necessarily. I think it's on diversity of supply chains. So what we've seen is that we have a much more, or we had a much more global supply chain coming into uh, the coronavirus crisis, um, but also there was significant market concentration um, around a, a number of those things, you know, chips, for example, right now are, are produced primarily by one company in Taiwan, which is all, it's a choke point economically, but also politically at the moment. Um, so there are these vulnerabilities that I think we now realize we need to probably address. I think Japan actually, after the meltdown of Fukushima, um, and, uh, you know, the natural disaster they had, you know, in quick succession, is probably a good lesson for many of us because Japan now isn't seeing its prices spike much to their, um, you know, dismay in some ways because they wouldn't mind a little inflation, but they're not seeing um, the kinds of disruptions that we're seeing in the West. And I think it may have been because of lessons learned, um, you know, back after Fukushima melted down. And I think there are a few things Japan has done that might help with resiliency, but that doesn't increase costs prohibitively for Japanese companies. One is they have much uh, tighter relationships with suppliers, so they get sort of more insight on shortages faster. So that's a piece, I think, of, of the puzzle. Um, and secondly, their inventory to sales ratios are higher than ours in the West, certainly in the US and also in Europe. And so that increases costs a little bit, but seems to have helped uh, Japan weather this storm a little bit better than the rest of us. So I, I don't buy the argument that globalization is dead because that hot take comes out after every choke point comes out. Um, but I do think we are thinking about how to diversify our supply chains, if not to onshore specifically and to completely localize supply chains. I do think global supply chains are here to stay. Um, I'd also say industrial policy is popular now. Um, it, it's popular across the political spectrum in the US, which it hasn't been for a long time. It's certainly um, emerged in Europe as well. And so I think industrial policy is a piece of this that's gonna um, be with us for a while. I'll leave it there. Very interesting, Megan, thank you. Um, uh, if I can, if I could move on with, with one question to to uh, to Barbara, uh, uh, there's been a, a, a long effort for the past two or three years uh, about the digitization of uh, uh, the supply chain. Uh, everything from uh, uh, the, uh, the the idea of open platforms where every uh, party which is participating, whether it's a ship, uh, where it's cargo or uh, customs offices, port officials, they have an open platform with a click of a button on their on their mobile phone or on their laptops, uh, and and this would certainly move things forward. There would be less custom checks. Uh, there would be less problems uh, changing crews. Uh, uh, but, you know, the, the cargo would move forward far more efficiently. Uh, I wanted to ask, Barbara uh, authored uh, a, a study uh, uh, to that effect uh, uh, last year. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, my question would be, how far are we from having uh, this, uh, this, this, this platform, this digitized platform where everyone uh, can uh, can participate, and whether there is issues like uh, uh, trust. I mean, can you put all these things out of the open, right? Does do all the participants trust each other? Uh, this these issues have been have been raised. Thank you, Costas, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for uh, for hosting this important discussion and for having me participate. Um, you know, Costas, you're right. The uh, perfection is not attainable. And the race to lower latency and increase efficiencies, as well as security in the supply chain transaction system, uh, has, like Megan said, on other issues, this predates the pandemic. How close are we? Well, um, I'm confident Penny could talk about all of the ways that UPS and, and, and everyone else in the industry 
Chris could talk about in the shipping space, much of it already is digitized. Much more will be digitized. The WTO yesterday hosted a session on the use of blockchain, which goes very much to the issue of trust in the sense that one can automate uh, the, 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 the verification process, the authentication process, and deliver significant operational efficiencies automatically through the technology. And um, the, the paper I wrote for the Atlanta Council last year uh, really focused on some easy, pragmatic shifts that work with the grain of existing activity to deliver improvements in the supply chain um, uh, cost efficiency and, and security. However, there are bigger issues as well. So if you think about the blockchain, if you think about the fact that we live in a distributed age, the diversification of supply chains, the resilience of a supply chain is profoundly distributed. And this can generate significant economic growth for a countries around the world, both through FDI and the creation of additional production capacity and through more efficient trade facilitation, which by the way, started after the great financial crisis, um, can increase the nimbleness of shifts in shipping. All of these are very positive developments that tend to get overlooked when, when some big crisis occurs. Um, and, and one could think about the vulnerabilities. I prefer to think about the opportunity. So the technology makes it possible to shift on a dime when necessary. It also makes it possible to distribute the economic gains and the economic interrelationships between sovereigns, which is the very foundation of the Bretton Woods system. Um, and as a member of the Bretton Woods Committee, I believe strongly that we are all better off and we all grow better when we engage together in international commerce rather than aim toward autarkic uh, economies that seek to develop everything domestically. That's not efficient and it doesn't generate growth globally. And I think it's very important to think about the interconnections and the positive components of interconnections. The last, um, the last element of that, which Penny mentioned, which I really think is important to underscore is the people. So whether you want to think about it as a workplace safety issue, or whether you want to think about it as an efficiency issue, the, the health measures associated with protecting the people that work in the supply chain from the factory to the ports is crucially important to keeping the system functioning as well. And I think um, a lot of companies have been doing a lot of work on that in the last year. We're far from done, uh, but it, it, is, it is, if you think about the, the, the massive explosion in consumerism and volumes, and you think about how the port workers and how the aviation workers have been managing, it's very impressive. And I think we should recognize the successes as well as identify vulnerabilities. Uh, thanks, Barbara. I want to follow up uh, uh, on this. This is going to be uh, uh, my last uh, my, my, my last question before we take uh, we take questions uh, from from our audience. Um, uh, it, it, just to follow up on this, uh, uh, port workers, uh, uh, sailors. Uh, people on the front line uh, that deliver uh, with uh, the aviation industry. There's been incredible problems. Uh, hundreds of thousands of seafarers uh, are still stuck in ships, still stuck in ships, uh, even to this day. Uh, I think it's only Singapore that has some kind of an efficient method, way to, to replace workers. And, and other hundreds of other thousands are waiting for work that can't travel. Uh, 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 digitization, digitization would, would digitization help with this uh, uh, with this issue? I think that we are still far away uh, with it. And what other remedies are there out there to address this? Can, can I start with Chris on this? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so will digitization help the plight of sailors and Steve Dawes and so on? The, the answer is no. You know, the, it's not, you know, the, the issue there is government willingness to allow people to travel in time of national or international emergency. Um, you know, the, the sailors haven't been held up because, you know, some computer system didn't know where to send them. It was held up because of countries, governments following their national interest. Um, we're, uh, you know, technolo technology optimists uh, here at S&P Global Panjiva, but there's some things that, that just can't be done. You know, for example, we're, we're concerned about um, the single-user single, single user threat scenario for blockchain. You know, it's a secure ledger, but the users are not secure, for example. Um, a dispatch system for sailors can help improve things, but it doesn't change the fact that at some stage, somebody's got to steer a boat and somebody's got to lift a box. And governments together have got to do better. Uh, I think it's incumbent on the International Maritime Organization and the other multilaterals to make sure that we learn the lessons and, and frankly put, just do it better next time. Where technology can help, um, and, and this isn't digitization, where technology can help is through automation. Um, that's automation of ports, which I know is deeply unpopular uh, with unions, as you would expect. Um, it's not without its risks. You know, we've seen the new software system at Felixstone cause significant trouble with operating that port. Um, but you know, autom automation is, is an area. Autonomous ships, uh, whilst you wouldn't necessarily want an 18,000 TEU uh, container ship to be running at sea without anybody on board, I think for shorter haul feeder routes, it's certainly possible. And for onward distribution, it's certainly possible as well. I know a lot of the freight forwarding firms and the 3PLs like UPS are, are pursuing these technologies as well to reduce the human risk um, in, inherent in the logistics industry. And of course, it's a good efficiency measure as well. Uh, Megan, uh, how much, uh, how serious do government, uh, financial institutions, banks, uh, uh, and other uh, investors take this digitization drive in the supply chain that, that uh, Barbara uh, and, and Chris uh, mentioned? How much money is there actually going to support do this, uh, do this uh, 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 projects have, right? from politicians that are basically looking two, three, four years down the line, that's basically what, you know, they, 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 that's the horizon that they're looking, not much further, uh, uh, whether while this digitization drive, uh, especially with the supply chain, is expensive, uh, and it's going to take years, it's gonna be an ongoing process, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think the digitization certainly helps both efficiency and resiliency. Um, so I mentioned that usually that's a trade off, but here digitization can help with both. But to Chris's point about the autom automation side of that, I think, um, you know, it depends on the country. So, uh, you know, it depends on how many workers are actually looped into uh, that supply chain, how much of your workforce that is. But these kinds of jobs tend to be high wage, high hour jobs, um, you know, goods producing jobs. They're very worker intensive, a lot of them. And so if we are automating a whole bunch of these jobs away, we're getting rid of exactly the kinds of jobs that we actually really want to be creating um, in an era when we are mostly creating services producing jobs, because of course we mostly consume services these days and services producing jobs tend to be really low hour, low wage jobs. So this feeds into a much bigger problem in the developed world, at least about um, our labor force and what kind of jobs we're, creati we're creating. And this is a good example of, of the kinds of jobs we want to have um, and we're automating them all away. Penny, can you uh, tell us? Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit uh, uh, about how uh, the, uh, the 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 air freight, the aviation sector is looking at the digitization process? I I, I mean, you guys have uh, are extremely busy with the distribution of vaccines. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you have developed uh, processes to s speed up this uh, digitized process. 
to speed up uh, uh, to speed up uh, the distribution. Uh, can you talk a little bit about it? Sure. So um, if I could, though, I'd like to start with the people because um, I think as Barbara rightly noted, uh, we have had a phenomenal um, dedication by our pilots for the past year and many, many others of our frontline workers. But for today's purposes, I want to just talk about our pilots, um, which in the sense that um, when you think about goods moving around the world, it's people also moving. And we've been in a period where we have not had consistent rules globally. And so our pilots, and, and the rules can change at a moment's notice due to pandemic conditions. And it's been very, very challenging for our pilots and uh, to move around the world and to go through different processes and procedures with constant changes. And, and it's something that I think is really important from a safety perspective that sometimes gets lost. Uh, our pilots fly in, are locked in hotel rooms, they have food delivered to the door, they're not allowed to leave and then until they until their flights. And it's it's a real challenge. And it's one that I think um, I'd love to see a Bretton Woods for for the movement of essential workers at some point in the future because all of this stuff moves moves because of people and it will for a long time. And um, I just think that it's an incredibly important point that, that gets sometimes a, a bit lost. And our folks have been the ones that have been having to navigate all of this for the, for the past year plus. And it's, 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 they've, been, they've been extraordinary in their dedication to helping move all of these goods for everybody around the world. Now, on the digitalization front, the, the, the point I would just say is, is that I think there's a, a lot going on there, and I'd love to build on the point about, if you think about the infrastructure package coming out in the United States today, which we haven't spoken of, but there's going to be some investment, I think, in, in ports and other things, um, roads, a lot of the important aspects of infrastructure. But going back, I think customs is one of those things digitalizing and creating more efficiency and custom systems around the world. We saw that take place during the COVID pandemic where people erased uh, or eliminated some of the requirements, paper-based trade still, um, getting the chops in Asia physically still to move goods around the world. A lot of that was, was suspended during COVID-19, but we're starting to see some of it creep back. And so I think when we think about digitalization, there is tremendous opportunity there at the border. And that's something that we're very focused on, particularly because we've seen low value shipments. So all this B2C is, it has, has, has exponentially grown in the past year. It's hitting borders. It's difficult for governments to process. There's ways to digitalize it, make it faster, shar smarter, sharper in terms of its processing. But it's expensive. It's really, and, and it's not necessarily the sexiest of issues to, to, to digitalize the border, shall we say. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. But that would be a tremendous um, opportunity to, to increase collections, attack illegal trade, as well as to help facilitate legitimate trade to help economies around the world. Thank you. Can I, before I, we, I, I go back to Barbara uh, to, 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 to summarize the, the digitization move, uh, Penny, can you give us, uh, if you can remember, an anecdote uh, of one of your pilots, uh, uh, not now with the distribution of the vaccines, where they are all welcome, I imagine, but what are your pilots flying, uh, I don't know, from uh, uh, London to uh, to New York or from uh, Beijing uh, to some to the Middle East? Uh, at the best, at, at the peak of the of the coronavirus of, of, of the pandemic, uh, tell us a little bit what they faced. Although it wasn't commercial, it was freight, the pilots, the crew. Yeah, so I think it was just constantly evolving conditions. And so if you're a pilot right now, um, it's, and frankly, if you're scheduling our crew at the moment, um, you know, if you're a pilot can't have been, if you want to fly to Hong Kong, you couldn't have been in certain countries in the last few days. If you wanted to fly to, to London, you couldn't have been in certain countries in the past 14 to 21 days. That changed quickly. Um, you couldn't have had COVID in the last 21 days. Um, 
most places when you landed, you were, you're not allowed to take a walk. So if you think about yourself, when you have jet lag, many of us go try to take a walk, expose ourselves to sunlight, um, go have a nice meal. Uh, that that was this is not the case. A lot of countries treat pilots, and we we maintain a closed system. We try to keep our our pilots, um, uh, you know, minimally exposed for their own sake as well as for the population's sake. We we put them in a closed system, but they're they're not allowed to do any of those things at the moment. So they're really they they land, they go straight to their hotel room, they stay there, and because of scheduling, that could be several days. They're not allowed out. Um, to do anything, um, and then they, they, they come back and they fly. And in many cases, um, they're tested upon arrival, and if by chance uh, we test them, uh, we offer to test them when they leave um, their destination, and we have that option. But if they, uh, if they land and they had tested negative upon departure and they now test positive upon arrival, in some countries they've been put in 21-day quarantines. So they're kept away over Christmas, over holidays from their families. So and it's um, it's it's I, re, I just I can't speak enough to what our pilots have been doing for the past year. I just cannot speak enough for what they're doing and what I think many of us don't understand in terms of the dedication of what people have been doing to kind of get stuff around the world. And I guess the same holds uh, for seafarers. Barbara, let's uh, if if we if I can. If I could ask you uh, uh, on how digital tools uh, can help relieve this incredibly bad crew change situation. Well, I tend to agree with Chris that many of the challenges can't necessarily, at, at the human level, at the in, human interaction level, cannot really be um, mitigated significantly by technology. I mean, one could envision um, platforms and applications that uh, collate and organize and visualize for the user all the different regulatory requirements in place so that uh, uh, a company can more efficiently prepare its workforce for the challenges. But at the end of the day, I think Penny is right that policymakers need to come up with some pragmatic solutions. The reality is that it's going to take quite some time to distribute vaccines to the, the entire global population, or at least as much as one can hope for. So this isn't going to happen. This is a situation that's going to continue for quite some time. Um, the, the paper I wrote for the Atlantic Council last year also had a component that talked about the sanitation, the sanitization of the, the supply chain for this reason. Um, health and safety regulatory requirements are some of the most core components of government responsibility to its citizens. And that by definition makes them uniquely challenging to harmonize on a cross-border basis. This is not a digital solution. The, the digitization is all about efficiency. It's about decreased latency. It's about um, security with supply chain. It is about um, decreasing uh, uh, the opportunity for, uh, for criminal activity within the shipping system. But, but when we're talking about the health and safety of the populations, when we're talking about the health and safety of the workers, you know, that, that is something that is, is very difficult to implement. Um, one can see the WTO, which, by the way, doesn't get enough credit for the amount of money it funnels to um, emerging markets to improve their technological infrastructure for customs facilitation. But I don't think the WTO or even really the Burton Woods system is well designed to address uh, harmonization of even emergency health measures. Um, I, would, I know that uh, heads of state and government uh, recently this week, in fact, have been calling for a pandemic treaty. They've been calling for uh, uh, increased agreements on vaccine distribution. Um, I, I think that in a universe where we are clearly making the decision to keep the global economy open, and our citizens and our consumers are all keeping economies functioning by purchasing products, um, 
it strikes me that engaging in some kind of uh, productive, pragmatic framework for standards related to cross-border travel, at least for essential workers in the supply chain, is eminently sensible. But I am not aware that any of such discussions are currently underway. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, let me let me move uh, let me move on to uh, some of, uh, uh, of the questions that we have from our audience. Um, the shipping industry and the logistics uh, logistics change are levers, highly leveraged enterprises that have benefited from lower rates uh, and the availability of capital. If if they're not able to react fast uh, on the uh, they could contribute to an inflation shock, right, from the supply side, uh, that would naturally uh, result uh, in much higher funding costs and hurt the industry. Uh, what can be done uh, so this logical sequence uh, breaks? Uh, and I think that you know it, it should break. Uh, Megan, can I can I start with you? Um, sure. So if you did get a uh, inflation spike, um, I think, first of all, it would be temporary uh, until these issues are sorted out. And so, um, you know, there are lots of different kinds of inflation. It's the kind of sustained one that causes people to um, think that inflation will continue spiking forever that you really need to worry about. Um, but for this question in particular, it's about funding costs for the industry. and uh, it's possible that you could get a spike because there are disruptions to the industry. Um, should we do something about that? I actually am not sure that we should. Are there things you can do about that? Certainly. I mean, the Fed has stepped in in this crisis in a way none of us could have imagined just over a year ago. So, um, you know, you could get the central bank supporting um, a particular industry. They really don't want to do that because they don't want to be picking winners and losers, which they would be doing if this were the case. Um, that being said, they, they're already picking winners and losers because if you hold what the Fed's buying, you win. So um, there's kind of a, a slippery slope there already. Um, you could also have sort of fiscal support um, coming from the government for the industry in particular, which we have seen also in this crisis, the airline industry is a great example of that. Um, I think our government gave more money to Delta Airlines than it did to um, childcare in this crisis, for example. So you could get the government stepping in as well. But again, I'm, I'm not sure that it's appropriate actually to have policymakers come in um, and address this kind of temporary shock in the market, in part because it is temporary. Um, about a year ago, we saw oil prices going negative, and there was a lot of talk about the government stepping in to support the oil industry, which I think would have been a terrible idea, actually. And thankfully, they didn't. Um, it could be an opportunity to kind of clear out some of the brush um, in the shipping industry um, or the transport industry um, without taking down the whole industry. So I actually don't know that, that policymakers should step in to do anything for a temporary spike like this. Chris? Uh, is uh, how about funding for the shipping industry? The, the ship owners are facing some some real uh, challenges uh, going forward. New generation of ships that will bear methanol, that will bear uh, uh, ammonia, or anything that uh, or anything that does not emit uh, CO two. Uh, uh, this is quite a big change. We're way away from reaching uh, that point, but there's a lot of capital uh, that needs uh, to come in so we can develop the new engines, that we, that we can develop any changes in, in ship hulls, uh, uh, and, and a lot of banks have just pulled out of shipping. It's basically China's Chinese leasers that are in, and of course, this may sound a little bit like Silicon Valley, so everybody would, would jump on it. But it's not like this. It's just it's still shipping loans, and shipping loans are have gone very, very badly, and, and banks don't want to go into them. Uh, give me your thoughts. Yeah. So I think the first thing is the the shipping industry is making you know very good money at the moment. You look at the 
earnings figures that you get from companies like uh, Zim Shipping, uh, Costco Shipping, who reported just today, Hapag Lloyd, Maersk. These guys are, are all making very good money at the moment. And we're seeing a spike in new vessel orders uh, as a consequence. You know, there, there's not been very much in the way of new vessel orders over the past uh, three years or so. So I think last year we got to a trough, but the order book for new container ships was only uh, below 10%, I think it's around 8% of the existing fleet. That's now, um, if memory serves, more than doubled. And that's because there's a confidence in the industry to invest for the future. And a lot of that's been driven by the uh, capacity and pricing discipline that the industry showed during last year. So during the downturn, I mean, during previous trade downturns, everyone's kept offering boats at any price. They've compressed returns. And of course, in 2016, Hanjin shipping uh, went bankrupt as a result. This time around, we had a lot of blank sailings last year. We tracked that in our research, and, and I know plenty of other people have as well. And that was a sign that the shipping alliances, the big three shipping alliances, did a good job of matching supply to demand. And, and that's an inherent economic problem for this industry. You know, you've got boats that you build and they last for 20, 25 years. Um, you can only order them and get them built on a two and a half year basis. So responding to short term demand shocks is really complex and that's not going to change. So the industry will go through this boom and bust cycle in terms of volumes. Uh, the trick, as always, with finance is to match your assets to your liabilities. And, and so it's about financing these new vessels in the right way. And that involves long term fixed rate debt to match the commitment that you're making on, on the vessel purchase side and then keeping everything else within your cost base as flexible as possible. I think what we are seeing now, though, uh, during the current uh, annual contract round is a lot of cargo owners um, asking for uh, fixed term, fixed price contracts. So to try and get rid of some of this volatility. So I think there's a industry or systemic wide attempt to reduce the inherent volatility in the shipping industry, which should make the whole thing more financeable. The big challenge, though, that the sector is facing that actually the power generating sector that I covered many years ago went through. Um, is facing up to decarbonisation. And certainly Maersk have said, look, we're trying to make decisions on a 20, 25 year basis now when we don't know which fuels we're going to be required to use. Are we going to have to just use, as you mentioned, things like methanol or, or ammonia, um, and go carbon neutral there at the tailpipe, as it were, or the, the, the stovepipe, as it were? Um, or are we uh, actually going to have to move over to something radically different, um, electric autonomous vehicles I talked about earlier, um, uh, sorry, vessels, um, as I talked about earlier, um, or are we going to have to go back to hybrid systems, including a return to uh, the good old days of, of sales of, of wind power, albeit with, with new technologies? And I think the sooner that governments can put the framework and the rules in place for that, the better, and the more harmonised they are globally, the better. Most corporations that we speak to will say, look, we don't care what the rules are as long as we know what the rules are and as long as they don't change. And I think we have a real opportunity at this stage for governments to set the rules. We don't need them um, to Megan's point. We don't need them to put big financing into the system. Uh, we don't need big loan backstops. We do need them to support original technology investments. That's what government does well is broad spread funding for research and development and education in the field. Um, it could also help if there was some money from the Biden uh, administration's infrastructure plan for ports, particularly to, to, to adapt to some of these new technologies. But clear rules, clearly set and stuck to are, are what the industry needs to um, ensure you get the right financing for the right vessels um, for, for the next 25 years. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, we are uh, coming close to, uh, to close of the event. So let me put another uh, 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 question for all of you. Uh, uh, it, it comes from uh, uh, the uh, from uh, uh, Willem Janis, who's a professor at Fordham Law School. Uh, he's raised an interesting question about uh, inflation and, and, and sourcing. He, what he says is, would the trade-off of higher inflation be worth it through higher wages and benefits? And perhaps more social stability by insourcing and deglobalizing supply chains and producing more in the U.S. Uh, as it would support uh, uh, as it would, it would support uh, uh, more U.S. interests uh, and give more American 
uh, more Americans work. Uh, of course, this is just from one part of, of the world, but I guess the question uh, uh, stands uh, for every country that is looking or envisages to deglobalize uh, supply chains. Uh, uh, can, I, can, can I start with Penny on this? Sure. So I, I would just make a comment. When we when we work with customers and we, we talk to folks about their supply chains, I would just point that reshoring or bringing all of your manufacturing back to your home country, it, it creates it also creates risk. They're just different risks. And so I think going back to Megan's point that she made earlier in the presentation, it's it's sometimes more about diversification, just as you know, the the most the most resilient ecosystems in the world are those that have the largest amount of diversity in them. And I think that if you think about supply chains with sole sources of supply or, or things like that, that's, that's where you really need to, that's where you really need to rethink things. So whether it's you onshoring certain things, reshoring certain things, whatever it is, I, I just, I would just caution people not to kind of have this, thought that by bringing everything back to your home country, you're eliminating risk because, as we know, hurricanes hit, certain other, certain other things hit supply chains in a way that doesn't necessarily eliminate risk in those cases. It just creates different and new ones. And so I think diversification in terms of resilience is a much more important thing for people to be thinking about and, and reviewing. Megan, can I have your final thoughts? Yeah, so I'm not sure that wages would naturally go up in that scenario. Um, and I would highlight that um, workers are also consumers. And so you would have to, if, if you did assume that wages went up, um, you would also have to consider that so will prices. Um, and so net net uh, people might not be better off. Um, I'd also just highlight that I think globalization gets a bad rap for um, driving inequality. Uh, and that actually I think technological advancement plays a much bigger role than many people seem to appreciate. And there's no way to stop that train, right? So even if we were to onshore, uh, there are a whole bunch of other reasons why we continue to create low wage, low hour jobs, why inequality particularly in the US um, is, is higher than everywhere else, but continues to grow. Um, and so I, I don't think that onshoring is, is really the answer here. And localizing supply chains, Chris, uh, 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 could be you know, a part, an idea out there, but even localizing supply chains, local supply chains, would still use the Suez, right? So... <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, uh, it's it's something which is which 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 I guess is 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 a a a, a logistical process on a smaller scale through the same waters. Does it really? Does this really make sense? I think nearshoring um, doesn't necessarily help you. Um, we saw some of the mismatches between opening of Mexico and the US during the pandemic and what that did to automotive supply chains. And that's pretty much as, as close as you you can get, you know, having having uh, supply chains geographically that that close together. Um, for me, the bigger answer towards nearshoring is the use of more automation. So over the longer term, looking at where things like additive manufacturing can be used more aggressively, um, maybe assembly so that we're not shipping big blocks of air inside finished products around. and you know, using more local automation in that regard doesn't help jobs, unfortunately, and, and therefore probably not a vote winner and therefore not necessarily something that governments can get behind. But, you know, hopefully if we're talking about this issue again in, in 10 years time, it's only going to be raw materials and so on that are, are moving through some of these big waterways and, and you know, de-risking the supply chain by going for local assembly um, may well have cured some of the issues. Thank you. I want to thank... Uh, uh, oh, actually, make can I, can I just, Barbara. yes, yes, sorry. No worries. Yeah. Um, I'll be quick though. Uh, history, especially the first half of the 20th century, history tells us that high inflation tends to increase political fragility and highly concentrated autarkic economies tend to have in the past 
encouraged um, high concentrations of government power, which is not conducive to personal or economic freedom. The bread and wood system profoundly sought to break that chain and tried to create a set of incentives and a set of economic relationships that were beneficial to everyone that would help people grow um, through trade and, th and, and through trade also through human interaction and engaging with each other, precisely to prevent the kinds of economic stresses and political stresses that create war. That doesn't mean it was perfect. But as the video showed at the beginning, there are components that merit continued engagement. Autarkic economies tend not to be stable. And so the, the, the fairy tale that onshoring will necessarily bring economic stability, I, I think, has a, a hard time finding factual foundation. Thank you, Barbara. And I want to thank everyone that participated on this uh, panel uh, and our audience. I want to thank the Atlantic Council. It was a pleasure to be with you uh, here today. Also, thank you so much. And I, I just want to thank everyone on this panel. Um, Penny, Megan, Barbara, Chris, there's such a wide ranging and important conversation to have at this moment. Uh, as you know, we planned this before the Suez situation, but I think it just brought all these issues into dramatic relief. And I want to end with something Penny said about a Bretton Woods for essential workers. One thing Suez reminded the world is that the global economy moves because of people, and that's fragile, and that could be delicate, and that could be upset, and it affects everyone. And so these are issues we are going to continue to work on here at the Atlantic Council, the Geoeconomic Center. Next week, we've talked a lot about Bretton Woods today. So next week is, of course, IMF World Bank Spring Meetings. We have a lot of events. You can sign up for them. We're dropping the link in our chat. And following that, we have a major event comparing U.S. and EU economic response to the crisis. So please stay with us at the Atlantic Council and thank you everyone for joining today.